All right, so I guess we're live. It's uh, about a minute before six o'clock p.m. Central Time. I'm Dr. Lewis Cady. Uh, about 15 years ago, I had the exciting option to found the Cady Wellness Institute, and I did. I've been very concerned about the COVID-19 epidemic, and I decided that as a public service to my patients, to my friends in Evansville and the Tri-State, and really whoever wants to wants to tune in to uh, to this, I I would start making some offerings available in terms of how to deal with the COVID-19 crisis. So the first topic, this this time is on how to boost your immunity. The, this is the first of five. The one that next week will be on uh, dealing with the psychological stress issues of being cooped up. Um, in the next one after that, I believe I've got do it to yourself, antidepressant therapy, not as crazy as it sounds. The last one will be on what's going to happen when we emerge from this. But in terms of deciding what to do the first time, I thought the most important thing is how do we boost our immunity and make it much less likely that we will get infected or even worse, sick or die with COVID-19. I trained at Mayo Clinic, and if you're a good son or daughter of Mayo, you always quote Dr. Charlie and Dr. Will. Dr. Charlie said there are two objects of medical education to heal the sick and to advance the science. And Dr. Will said the glory of medicine is that it is always moving forward, that there is always more to learn. And no time has that been more clear than in the current COVID pandemic. Just to uh, put this in context, I did train at Mayo Clinic in psychiatry, which the Scientologists consider an industry of death. I just thought I'd put it there for some color commentary. But as I started my practice of conventional psychiatry in 1993 in Evansville, I found that I couldn't get all of my patients totally well with just conventional medication. And so I began branching out. I looked at hormone replacement therapy, nutritional supplementation, um, herbs, uh, and more, and got really interested in what, what I call integrative functional medicine. And that's what I'm going to be telling you about tonight. <clears throat> so here's the face of the pandemic, COVID-19. Those are little red things that look like they are golf tees sticking out are the spikes that give coronavirus its name, corona, and that is also how it attaches to cells. It is, the virus is an RNA enclosed in, in protein, and there are the attaching uh, proteins, and here's the lipid membrane. This is, so that's a scheme, uh, schematic. This is actually what it looks like in real life. These are cells that are infected with coronavirus, and you can see the coronavirus emerging. As, as many of you, I'm sure, know, uh, viruses work by taking over cells, hijacking them, using the cells machinery to make more little copies of themselves, and then blowing up the, the cell and going and infecting others. Here is a close-up scanning electron micrograph of the actual virus particles themselves emerging from the cell. So the little yellow things, those are actually COVID-19 viruses. And that's what's going to get people sick and in some cases kill them. So here is my orientation to our topic tonight. We're gonna to talk about holistic things that you can use to boost your immune system. I'll describe some supplement strategies and just because of the lawyers out there, I will tell you this presentation does not constitute medical advice, nor my establishing a therapeutic or treatment relationship with you. The way you should use this responsibly is look at what I'm talking about tonight, do your own due diligence, talk with your healthcare practitioner, and <clears throat> be aware 
that as the Deshay warning says, which I will show to you very clearly in a moment, no supplement can be claimed to diagnose, prevent, treat, mitigate, or cure a disorder. So none of these supplements are guaranteed to prevent you or your loved ones from getting infected or dying from COVID-19. Please do not think that if you just take all the supplements that I'm talking about, you can go out with impunity, take your mask off and live dangerously. Uh, don't do that. Th this is uh, how to boost your immune system for responsible people. So I've got five steps that we're going to talk about tonight. Step one is adequate sleep. We got to have it. So whenever I'm thinking about explaining something to people or doing a program, I always go to PubMed. Gov. It's the National Library of Medicine online, and I like to see what the medical literature says. Now, I'm going to be showing a lot of those tonight, but I promise we're not going to get bogged down in the minutia. So let me model it on this. This is a study of about 57,000 female nurses. That's an adequate N, as the st statisticians call it, in the Nurses' Health Study. And they were free of any kind of disease and they had no prior history of pneumonia. So what they found was when they age adjusted the relative risk for pneumonia, if a nurse slept less than or equal to five hours per night, her risk was 1.39, her relative risk was 1.39, which means 39% above baseline. If, however, the nurse herself perceived inadequate sleep, in other words, I know I'm not getting adequate sleep and she's subjectively aware of that or he's subjectively aware of it. The relative risk was 1.5, which means 50% increased risk. So take home message, if, you're not, if you feel like you're not getting adequate sleep at night, you've got a 50% increased risk of pneumonia, uh, at least if you're a nurse in this study. This was another study on uh, sleep and nutrition interactions implications for athletes. And the take home message is there in yellow at the bottom. Sleep has been shown to have a restorative effect on the immune system. And this is all about boosting the immunity tonight. Uh, let's see, I think I've got a glitch here. I beg your pardon, just one moment. And I've got Elizabeth Harrington and Corinne Floyd in the background. Hopefully they're not panicking. <clears throat> All right, they, they've helped me set this up. All right, let's try this again. So here are my common sense sleep tips. A regular set bedtime and wake up time. Don't take naps during the day. No big meals within, and I left some range here, four to six hours of bedtime. No vigorous exercise within four to six hours of bedtime. No caffeine within six to 12 hours of bedtime. It depends on your cytochrome P450-1A2 genotype. That is how you break down caffeine in your liver. And some people are poor metabolizers, which means if, if they drink caffeine at 11 o'clock in the morning, it could keep them up at night. And then there are others, the hypermetabolizers that could have three or four cups of espresso at Starbucks and go home and sleep like a baby. So your mileage may vary depending on that enzyme. A hot bath six hours before bedtime. I learned about this from Dr. Peter Hari, who was the co-medical director of the Mayo Clinic Sleep Lab. And he said that it mimicked or it, it simulated the effect of a drop in body temperature. And when your body temperature drops, it puts you in a more <clears throat> susceptible state for sleep. So by taking the hot bath, about as hot as you can stand it, and then six hours later going to bed, your body temperature goes down and it's helpful. Noise perfume, which is white noise. You can get an old fan that you've got in the house and turn it on, or a noise machine, white noise machine, or the TV playing static. Supplements which can be used, uh, melatonin, instant release, or compounded, and then there are three supplements there, GABA, L-theanine, and taurine. They're all very useful. They're all, e each one of those is natural. Uh, melatonin is actually a hormone inside the body, and so we'll talk about that. 
Now I dropped this in here because this is a picture of a natural cortisol rhythm. And this person has got stressed adrenals. Actually, if you look very carefully, you should be in the green, the, the darker green throughout the day. So in the morning, your cortisol level comes up and then it goes down as the day progresses. And this is important because if your cortisol is down in the morning, you'll be sluggish. And if your cortisol is up at night because you're stressed, you won't be able to get to sleep. So the maintenance of a diurnal cortisol rhythm is very helpful, which can be done in one of two ways. If you're flat on your back with adrenal exhaustion, then you will need adrenal support in the earlier part of the day. And if you've got normal adrenal function in the morning and you can't sleep at night, then you may need something for sleep. So there's the ideal pathway right there. And this is just uh, lab values from this. So let's talk about melatonin. I really like it. Uh, anything that the body makes naturally is usually a good thing. It's secreted by the pineal gland. The production decreases with age. The effectiveness of melatonin decreases with age. Uh, it is critical for the establishment of the circadian rhythm, the day-to-day -day rhythm. It's actually a reproductive hormone in lower animals. And when I checked on it this week, uh, April 25th, there were 26,000 and 90 citations on melatonin and 4,597 citations on sleep. So I would submit to you, it's well studied. There are several things that have been found out about what melatonin does. Number one, it's an anti-tumoral uh, agent. It is used to treat rhythm disorders, jet lag, shift work, blindness, it improves sleep latency, sleep efficacy, and rising sleep quality scores in the elderly. It actually re regulates the tone of the cerebral arteries. We're getting a little bit beyond the, uh, the uh, uh, immune system boost. And it's the major messenger of light-dependent periodicity. In other words, it helps you get a good night's sleep. And since we know that sleep is associated with immune function, I thought it was pretty important that we cover it. So, Here's some fun facts about melatonin. It increases at night. It peaks 40 minutes after you are deprived of light. You have a normal level of melatonin by the morning. The half-life of melatonin is really only 15 minutes to 45 minutes. So if you're taking a supplement, uh, it's gonna be out of your system pretty quickly. That may mean that you need to have a sustained release supplement. At one year of age, you're a melatonin secreting stud. That's when, you're, when you can really put it out. And then as your life goes on, your melatonin output goes down through senescence. And when you flip on the lights, excuse me, when you turn off the lights, melatonin goes up 25 to 100 fold. There is no toxic dose. <clears throat> Oops. You can't kill yourself with it. And the physiologic dose, that's what your body secretes is about 0.3 milligram from the pineal gland. It increases natural killer cell activity, at, which is uh, helpful for your immunity. It modulates immune function. In Cell Discovery 2020, just last month, it was found that it, it could be used in what's called a network-based drug repurposing for treatment of actually COVID-19. So it was one of the things that was used in this drug cocktail. It may improve nighttime urination, which is really good for older guys with big prostates. And it relieves oxidative stress um, and immunological changes in rats. In terms of melatonin and respiratory disease, not just for sleep, but respiratory disease, <clears throat> it's been found to have antiviral benefit. And uh, according to Habtamarium and colleagues, numerous scientific reports on the potential of melatonin in asthma and respiratory diseases for infections. It, it's got some benefit in respiratory diseases for infections. So another thing for melatonin. This is uh, this magnificent graph here, which I spent hours and hours on. No, I'm just kidding. Shows what happens with a regular dose of melatonin where it comes up shortly and basically in two hours, it's all gone versus a sustained release, which comes up 
and hangs around for a while and then drops off by about six hours. So you may need to actually use some of each, a regular instant release and a sustained release melatonin. And by the way, I'm preparing a handout on all of the supplements that I'm talking about. Make sure we have your emails, send us a query, want to have the handout and we'll send it to you. So 10% uh, of people that you give melatonin, they have no benefit apparently at all, but it's still a healthy supplement. One percent of the population has a paradoxical energizing effect. So you take it and suddenly you've got, you're filled with energy and the last thing in your mind is sleeping. And then when you wake up in the morning, you're groggy and you just want to crash. One out of a hundred. So be aware of that. It's not really effective for those that are addicted to sleeping pills. And if they are, the way to do to use melatonin is high dose melatonin, get it up to a really good dose and then taper off the sleeping pills. So that's step one, good sleep. Step two, decrease your stress. Uh, stress suppresses the immune system. It upsets the digestive and reproductive systems. It increases your risk of heart attack and stroke, which most of you know. It shrinks the hippocampus up in your brain, which is where you store short-term memory. So, and it does it by increasing cortisol, and cortisol is what shrinks the hippocampus. By the way, the happy ending to that story is decreasing the stress, taking care of your brain, the hippocampus plumps back up again. Common causes for stress, pessimism, like when is this thing gonna be over? Inability to accept uncertainty, rigid thinking, lack of flexibility, <clears throat> negative self-talks, and this is what Daniel Amen, my friend and colleague calls ANT, automatic negative thoughts, unrealistic expectations and an all or nothing attitude. Don't do that to yourself in your head. When we look at the top 10 stressful life events, uh, this was from Siegel, Smith and colleagues, three, uh, excuse me, four of the top 10 stressful life events may be seen with the COVID-19. Number one is imprisonment. Getting locked up in the slammer is stressful, but also being locked away with the current social distancing policies. That probably has milder effects than incarceration, but still it's going to have some. Injury or illness, if you're sick or you have a loved one sick, that's going to be stressful. Job loss, I, I, last statistics I saw were like 18 up to the mid 20% of people have lost their job or have been furloughed right now. And retirement, and retirement is when you step away from what your life was all about. And that's what a lot of people are, are having to do with COVID-19. So I would suggest that COVID-19 and all of the assorted manifestations is an extremely stressful event. So here are just three citations. Again, I'm not gonna bog down. I've got the references in yellow there, so you will know I'm not trying to put one over on you, and these are peer-reviewed articles. So Gon and colleagues said that stress aggravates mucosal and immune damage in a mouse model. And the reason for a mouse model is say, well, what about humans? Well, you can stress mice much better than you can humans, because if you stressed humans the way you stress these mice, uh, the uh, Institutional Review Board, IRB, wouldn't let you do the study. So this was a way to look at, do stress mice have damage to their mucosa and the immune system? And the answer was yes. Uh, Sargent and colleagues found that stress causes death of leukocytes, the white blood cells, and their stem cells, the things that make white blood cells. And the more severe the damage comes with the longer the exposure. And Dunphy, Dohert, and colleagues found that stress disrupts your gut microbiota, immune, brain, axis, which is one of the reasons you have to take care of your gut. Here's another one. It alters immune responses during respir respiratory infection. A study of Thyler's murine encephalomyelitis virus, which is a mouse model of multiple sclerosis, found that the stress hormones, the glucocorticoids, were associated with decreased T cell function, which you need to battle this virus. And it also makes herpes simplex virus type one, that's the chicken pox, 
the, the shingles, the herpes zoster, the mouth ulcers, it makes it worse via an increase in the glucocorticoids. So that's what stress will do to you, not much of it good. What to do about it? First of all, I suggest you avoid catastrophizing and fortune telling. The reference that I've got here is the David Burns book, Feeling Good, The New Mood Therapy. And you can tell if you're fortune telling by using the statement down in orange. I, insert your name, in my all-knowing, omnipotent, godlike being, know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I'm gonna get sick, I'll have a hard time losing my, getting my job, I know I'll lose my job. This is fortune telling. And unless you're God, you don't know that. So let's, let's monitor what we're saying to ourselves in our head and not go over the top on these cognitive distortions. There are a number of them that uh, mind reading is another one, but fortune telling is the one that I think is going to be most disturbing to people in the middle of this crisis. And while I'm thinking about it, I know I'm giving you lots of references. Not only is a recording of this webinar going to be available, but I've already got it out on slideshare.net forward slash LKDMD, and I've got that reference at the end. So <clears throat> slideshare.net forward slash LKDMD, you can look at all of these slides. Here are some holistic interventions for dealing with stress. Keep a schedule. I, I was just talking with a teacher uh, that's home today, and she's stressed because the parents of her kids are not making them do their homework. So I suggest a regular wake up, she was sleeping late, a regular wake up, a regular bedtime, scheduled work, scheduled homework, maybe scheduling a job search if, if you're needing to hunt for employment or think you will. Exercise is a great stress buster that's been so studied that I don't even feel compelled to give you references to show that exercise helps with stress. And then meditate and practice mindfulness and meditation or prayer. If you're a Christian, read Psalms. If you're a Zen Buddhist, meditate. Um, if you're somewhere in between, uh, do whatever you want. Here are some ideas about the meditation apps. And I did this search yesterday, Sunday. So Headspace is the thought to be just about the best. It has a free trial, but after that, you're going to pay 13 bucks a month. If you're a healthcare professional, you can actually get it free uh, by putting in your UPIN number. <clears throat> Multiple others in this study, the Mindful Org, but well, in this first study, multiple others were similarly priced. So I went looking for free mindfulness apps. So there they are. Insight Timer, Smiling Mind, Stop, Breathe, and Think, UCLA Mindful, and 10% Happier, and they're platform agnostic. They'll work on either Android or iOS. And then I could not help myself but throw this one in. This is one of my favorite for long periods of concentration. Starship Sleeping Quarters, I kid you not. It's a deep bass. It sounds like you're on the Starship Enterprise with the warp engines going in the background. It's incredibly relaxing and it's 10 hours long. That's more than most people sleep. So there's the reference, youtube.com, put in Starship Sleeping Quarters and you'll land right there. That's the second thing. So number one was, um, Sleep, number two, decrease stress. Number three, step three, eat your fruits and veggies. Boost your antioxidants and consider vitamin C supplementation. So I'm gonna tell you about this. We can, in fact, measure carotenoids and antioxidants at, at Katie Willis Institute and other healthcare facilities, some. Uh, you can have a 30 second scan painlessly that will read out your carotenoid level from your palm on a beam of light. I know it sounds crazy, but it's actually been supported in the peer reviewed literature. So let me start with the expensive way to do it. This is an expensive way to do it. This is a urine test and you'll see that vitamin C in this person is higher range of normal, but it's certainly not pegged out on the right. Unfortunately, the N-acetylcysteine, NAC, which is a 
precursor for glutathione and a chelating agent is down in the bottom. So this is, this is about a $300 plus dollar test. <clears throat> this is about a $300 plus test. And this one's painful. This one you have to get stuck for blood. In both of these, you have to wait three weeks to get the results back. The net impression on this was the patient had profoundly low antioxidant state. This is a picture of me a few years ago and my then office manager, Claudia Brantley, showing the biophotonic scanner that we use in our practice. We love it. We, uh, we use it all the time. I personally monitor my own antioxidant scan score with that. And just a few reference articles to show that this isn't hocus pocus. This was published in British Journal of Nutrition 2013. And they looked at six different measurements on this Raman spectroscoper, spectro spectrometer, excuse me, and found that it was really well correlated with a single measurement. So you do it one time and you're good. You don't have to do it six times, once a month. Uh, one time will give you a good assessment of your antioxidant state. <clears throat> this is another study that showed the totality of the evidence supports the use of the skin carotenoid status as an objective biomarker of fruits and vegetable intake. And you're, you're asking yourself, so what's this all about? Why is this dude so hot to trot on fruits and vegetable intake? And I will show you in a minute. This is perhaps one of my favorite studies in all of the peer-reviewed literature. I, I know it, I love it. I'll, I'll show you this up in the top. If you go to PubMed and type in Akbarali Eva, it's the fifth one down from the top. It's been in the fifth spot for a while. So the EVA is the Epidemiology of Vascular Aging Study, and this is what was studied. 1,400 people, ages about 59 to 71. <clears throat> it lasted nine years. They found that if you were a man in the lowest quintile of carotenoids, you had a three-fold increase for death of anything. That's all-cause mortality and one, uh, about a 72% increased risk of cancer. Uh, women, it did, not, uh, it did not differentiate. And the conclusion was total plasma carotenoid levels were independently associated with mortality risk in men. Now keep in mind, I didn't say it, was, it would raise your risk for COVID-19 death and infection if you were in the lowest quintile, but follow me carefully for a moment. I want you to understand that this is associated with mortality. So when we look at antioxidants, which is what that scanner measures, carotenoids equals antioxidants, and this says antioxidants equal immune function. So as of Saturday, 19,633 citations on antioxidant and immune function. Here's a smattering of some of the things that I picked out from this 2017 article. Vitamin C supports epithelial barrier function against pathogens. Now, what does that mean? It means, and I've previously talked about decreasing stress, improving mucosal strength. So in order for the COVID-19 virus to get you, it's got to penetrate your epithelium and inside of you, your mucosa to get to the cells to infect. So vitamin C supports the barrier function against pathogens. It accumulates in phagocytic cells, those are the cells that munch up the invaders, and can enhance, and I'll tell you what this means in plain English, getting the cells closer to the offending agent, gobbling them up, and killing them with basically what amounts to hydrogen peroxide. Um, prophylactic prevention of infection requires a minimum of 100 to 200 milligrams of vitamin C per day. Treatment of established infection requires gram doses, and I take one gram twice a day, just for prevention right now. Here are three citations that look at vitamin C as an antiviral. And again, chemotaxis enhances the neutrophil, that's the, the white blood cell that gobbles up things, oxidative and uh, phagocytic capacity, and it supports lymphocytes, which are the white blood cells that kill viruses, proliferation and function. 
Here are four more citations. Uh, vitamin C has documented antiviral effect against influenza, herpes, polio virus, Venezuelan equine encephalitis, uh, HIV and parvovirus and rabies. Does it have an effect against COVID-19? Don't know. COVID-19 is a relatively new affliction on the planet. So those studies, those studies haven't been done, but I think anything that has this much antiviral capacity should be considered to protect yourself. And it also has a great utility uh, in another way after you've been infected. We'll get to that in a second. Here's some other things. Vitamin C inhibits Epstein-Barr virus activation or mono. It inhibits cytomegalovirus replication. It, it tightens the endothelial permeability barrier, and it's an essential factor on antiviral response to H3N1 influenza A. So it's, it's clearly a significant um, entity. This is a little bit difficult. The first one up there is looking at these GULO uh, negative slash negative knockout mice. It's a mouse model of vitamin C deficiency. It's interesting to know that us anthropoid primates like chimps, uh, monkeys, um, and guinea pigs have lost the ability to synthesize this enzyme, the L-gulono-Y lactone oxidase, and you have to have that to make vitamin C. And if you don't have that because you can't synthesize it, you can't make your vitamin C. Therefore, we have to take in vitamin C from outside of our body. So here were a couple of experiments. If you inoculated this H3N2 influenza in the little mice no uh, noses, if they were gulo negative negative, that was very lethal because they didn't have vitamin C. Um, here's something interesting down in uh, Nutrients 2018 by Marek and colleagues. It's used as an anti-inflammatory in the treatment of sepsis. <clears throat> some of you may have heard about the cytokine storms that are afflicting some seriously ill COVID-19 patients that ends up just wiping them out. An anti-inflammatory would be really helpful for that. And it decreases respiratory syncytial virus um, lung inflammation. Here is Here are two studies on sepsis and basically cytokine, cytokine storm. So the Merrick article, 2018, sepsis is associated with an acute deficiency of vitamin C. Vitamin C and the steroids and thiamine can act synergistically to reverse sepsis-induced organist function. At the very bottom, April 2020, this month, in Pharma Nutrition, Beretti and Bannock published that IV vitamin C could be helpful in the reduction of cytokine storm in acute respiratory distress syndrome. And that's what happens to COVID-19 patients when they get really, really sick. They have acute respiratory distress. So I'm, I'm a big fan of vitamin C. If I was lying in a hospital bed with COVID-19, I would want multiple gram infusions of vitamin C per day. Now, in that first functional test that I showed you that had the N-acetylcysteine and the vitamin C, what's that all about? Well, N-acetylcysteine is the substance that you need to take into your body to make glutathione. And this study by Wang and colleagues showed that N-acetylcysteine by itself suppresses viral replication. Uh, another study found that it reduced the frequency of respiratory influenza-like episodes, severity, and length of time in bed. It is a potent antioxidant, which harkens back to eat your fruits and veggies like your mama told you. And I, I could not <clears throat> stop myself with the vitamins. I've got to show you one on vitamin E. So this is showing what vitamin E does. It activates, and it's in the red box, it activates your T cells, it activates your B cells so you can make antibodies against stuff, and it activates your natural killer cells so they can go and 
glom on to the uh, infected COVID-19 cells and kill them before they can function as little viral replication factories. So vitamin E, very important for the immune system, and it's an antioxidant. One nutrient, one mineral that you don't usually think of as an antioxidant is zinc. It was discovered in 1960. It can have a, you can have a pro-inflammatory picture with zinc deficiency, which you do not want to have. You do not want to have a cytokine storm or a pro-inflammatory picture. And the quote from this article was, the benefits of zinc supplementation for a malfunctioning immune system become clear. My caution at the bottom, don't take more than 50 milligrams per day or it will drop your copper and then you'll be out of balance. That's the third thing. Eat your fruits and veggies, take antioxidants. Step four is take supplements. And I, I really want to talk about this a little bit. So I told you about this Deshay thing. Deshay is the Dietary Supplement Health Education Act. And it basically says you can't, nobody, no company, no healthcare practitioner, no multi-level marketing uh, person can tell you that a nutritional supplement can diagnose, treat, prevent, or cure any disease or medical condition. So keep that in mind. I'm not telling you that anything I have talked about today will prevent you from getting COVID-19. But I am telling you that all of these things appear to strongly support the immune system. And I think it is, if I can use the word, te teleologically reasonable that if you have a great immune system, that you will be more resistant to getting infected. So I've given you the Deshay warning. These supplements, however, are appropriate to support the structure and function of the human body. So I just thought I'd show you a couple of pictures. This is from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, vitamins, minerals, and supplements. Do you need them? The conclusion was, nah, no, not really. You should be able to get everything you need in a well-balanced diet. That's what they're always talking about. Here's one from Scientific American. You can read their thesis right there in the headline. Most supplements do not prevent chronic disease or death. Their use is not justified and they should be avoided. This is the standard propaganda that you hear from the anti-nutrient crowd. Which reminds me of what John Wayne had to say. Life is hard, it's harder if you're stupid. I think there's a lot of stupidity going on out there because it flies in the face of what is published in the peer-reviewed medical literature and what nutritionists and doctors actually do in their own private lives which I will show you. So this was a study, one of my favorite studies. It was published in JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association, also known as God's Medical Journal, the one, the only, the JAMA. It was published in 2002 by Fletcher and Fairfield. The topic was vitamins for chronic disease prevention in adults. And I'll show you the take home message. Pending strong evidence from randomized trials, it appears prudent for all adults to take vitamin supplements. And Fletcher and Fairfield said, <clears throat> the reason for this is the American diet is generally adequate to prevent things like scurvy and rickets and the obvious vitamin deficiency diseases, but it is not adequate to maximally support the structure and function of the body to, to, to deal with cancer, to deal with infection, et cetera. So take your supplements, 2002, JAMA 18 years ago. So we've heard fake news. This is not new news. This is old news. And there are multiple studies in the literature to support multivitamin supplementation. I like what George Soros had to say about it, despite he's not, he's not in the Donald Trump fan club. He said, once we realize that imperfect understanding is the human condition, there is no shame in being wrong only in failing to correct our mistakes. So I want us to correct our mistakes if we're making them in terms of our appreciation of supplementation. This is what my colleagues and the dietitians actually do. More physicians and nurses take supplements than recommend them. 
So let me see if I've got this blown up. I don't. 24% of physicians and 31% of nurses and advanced practice nurses say they always or frequently take vitamins. Here's, uh, here's another breakdown. 64% of women physicians are on a multivitamin or a multi multivitamin and a multimineral system. 51% of docs in this one and 59% of nurses are using dietary supplements. 37% of cardiologists, 50% of orthopedists, and 59% of dermatologists use supplements. I think there must be something to this. And remember the, the American Academy of Dietetics uh, journal article that said, yeah, you really don't need to do it. Well, three out of four of the dietitians, which I assume, who I assume were card-carrying members of their professional organization, were regular users of nutritional supplements in spite of the fact that their journal said, yeah, you really don't need to do it. So they must clearly know something about getting adequate nutrients. So today's reality, 68% of Americans take a dietary supplement, 55% of people trust their doctor for a recommendation, yet doctors don't talk about it. I'm talking about it now. I talk about it with my patients. Most of my patients are on a supplement or two at least. All right, <clears throat> so speaking of supplements, here's a solid one-two punch that you can use, vitamin D and probiotics, and there's a lot of evidence for both of them. So here's about vitamin D, the antimicrobial peptide pathway and its role in protection against infection. Here's the, here's the punchline. It's not that vitamin D is an antimicrobial or an antiviral. It's that it induces the gene expression of antimicrobial peptides. And this study says it's biologically important for the response of the innate immune system, that's what, what you've got in your body, to wounds and infections. And at the bottom it says the evolutionary selection to place the cathelicidin gene, that's the one that promotes the antimicrobial peptide gene, under the control of the vitamin D receptor allows for its regulation. So here are a couple of um, structure diagrams. The one that I want you to pay attention to is the one on the bottom right here, colocalciferol, vitamin D3. This is the active form. If we, if we look up here at the top, the ergosterol, if, if UV or sunlight hits your skin, that can be convert, that is converted to vitamin D2. And 7-dehydrocholesterol also in your skin is converted to vitamin D3. But th this is the foot soldier of the vitamin D axis. It's vitamin D3. <clears throat> so this study by UCL UCLA scientists found that vitamin D was, in effect, a potent antibiotic. It activates the body production of antimicrobial peptides. There are 200 of these peptides known, which destroy the cell walls, check this out, of bacteria, fungi, and viruses, including the influenza virus. I think I'm going to skip this because I don't want to get bogged down. Here's another one that the, ter determin the determination that vitamin D is crucial to activating our immune system. So without it, T cells will not be able to react or fight off serious infections. The T cells have got to be triggered into action and transformed from inactive into activated killer cells which are, quote, primed to seek out and destroy all traces of a foreign pathogen. And the T cells have to have vitamin D to activate. It is critically important for our immune system. So boosting immunity in munchkins, this was a study of 326 children in a double-blind placebo-controlled study. That's the way the FDA likes it. This was not an FDA study, but it's the way the FDA likes it. The kids were dosed twice daily for six months. There, were, there was a placebo group, a lactobacillus acidophilus group, and a lactobacillus acidophilus NCFM plus bifidobacteria animalis subspecies lactis. And the reason I've got that there is if your probiotic says lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, and that's all it says, that's probably not a really good one. You need something that has the species on it. And the conclusion of Lyer and colleagues in pediatrics 2009 was that daily dietary probiotic supplementation for six months 
was a safe, effective way to reduce fever, rhinorrhea, that's runny nose, cough incidence duration, and antibiotic prescription, as well as the number of missed school days attributable to illness. So very useful in kids. Um, not only does it have medical issues or medical benefits, but it actually can improve your mental state. So the first uh, paper there by Leon and colleagues, it improves behavior, cognitive, and biochemical aberrations caused by chronic restraint stress. <clears throat> this was a, a mouse study. Again, you can stress the little mice or rats much, much more effectively than you can humans. Uh, next one showed that probiotics yielded small but significant effects for depression and anxiety. The third one shows that there's this emerging concept of the gut microbiota brain axis, which suggests that modulation of what's going on in your gut can be a novel therapeutic target for the treatment of and prevention of mood and anxiety disorders. So with people coop, cooped up at home, socially isolating, this might be something to consider. Here's my recommendations for vitamin D and probiotics, 500 to 1,000 IU per day of vitamin D in kids, 5,000 IU per day for adults. I start almost all of my patients that way. I monitor the levels. Uh, if you get the vitamin D level too jacked up, you can have calcium oxalate stones. Uh, I haven't seen that at 5,000 IU per day, but I check. You have to take it with vitamin K2. If you're taking just a little bit of vitamin D, eh, don't worry about the vitamin K2. But if you're taking 5,000 IU of vitamin D per day, you should take K2, not K, K2. K1 is the clotting vitamin. K2 is the vitamin that will keep you from laying down calcium plaques in your coronary arteries and your internal carotid arteries. All my patients are on both of them. I take it myself on a daily basis. I take a specific brand that has 5,000 IU of vitamin D3 and 180 microgram of K2. And then here's the probiotics in adults. This is a minimum. Uh, you're perfectly welcome to take more than that. <clears throat> more supplements. Uh, we're making excellent progress on this. So don't worry, we're gonna be finished easily by eight and I'm planning on taking Q&A. So here's lysine. Lysine decreases the replication of the feline herpes virus. It suppresses clinical manifestations of the herpes virus infection, and it prevented what's called herpes simplex labialis, herpes infections on the lips in 26 volunteers. I use this all the time with my patients that get recurrent mouth sores, um, or I use it with patients with shingles. Uh, obviously, if they're on an antiviral, that's great but it's been found that viruses do not replicate well if there uh, is a high amount of lysine floating around. So I use it liberally and it's very difficult to, to hurt yourself with it. I, I suppose you could choke on the lysine bottle if you were trying to swallow it, but it's a very benign supplement. <clears throat> now, I found this patent application, I kid you not, April 9, 2020, you'll see in the top left, it's got antiviral supplementation formulations. And if you look in the bottom right, it says this disclosure provides an oral antiviral supplement composition comprising a lysine, that's what we just talked about, an ascorbic compound, that's vitamin C, a flavonoid glycoside, that's antioxidants, a threonine, and a pyridoxine, so there's, those are vitamins. Uh, <clears throat> so people are beginning to pat the use of lysine as an antiviral. I just thought that was really interesting, and there's what it says close up. Here are a couple of other plant-based antivirals. Lemon balm um, it has these things called phenolic compounds, which are phenols, and they have potent antiviral uh, activity. They neutralize viruses on contact by attaching to them and preventing their union with cell receptors. Gee, that sounds like a swell idea if you've got a COVID-19 little virus particle floating around in your body. And there are two citations there on that page. Sage is not just for holiday stuffing, it is actually another plant-based um, antiviral. 
which contains glycosides. Uh, again, it's an antioxidant, that's good. And then per the German Commission E, that's like the German equivalent of the FDA for supplements. They regulate what can be sold and the doses of supplements in Germany. So Germany, Commission E says sage is an antibacterial, fungostatic, virostatic, that means it holds viruses static or stable, doesn't let them replicate, and an astringent. Step five, shrooms, berries, and CBDs. I must tell you that I have two lovely ladies that have helped me put this on, Elizabeth Harrington and Corinne Floyd. And when I told Elizabeth about my shrooms, berries, and CBD slide, I said, now I'm not going to be talking about the bad shrooms. And she said, oh, too bad. But I'm not. I'm going to talk about the good shrooms. The good shroom, that, that there are a number of them, but this is my favorite. Ganoderma lucidum. It's known as reishi or ling chi in Chinese medicine. It's been used for centuries. It has antiviral effects against the enterovirus 71 infection. It's effective against HIV and EB71. And here's the breakdown. Polysaccharides and triterpenoids are the major antiviral constituents of Ganoderma species, but mechanisms are poorly defined. You can see a picture of the little red mushroom down in the bottom left. There is a particular supplier that I like that I think has got the best reishi of all of them, and I'm taking that twice a day. Here's the next, elderberry. Uh, I learned about this from my naturopath, Dr. Whitney Gabhart, who, who knows all of the natural things because that's what naturopaths do. They know the natural plants and medicinal things that can be used. So elderberry, I did not know this, one of the most used medicinal plants worldwide. Uh, antiviral and antimicrobial properties have been demonstrated and the FDA itself has categorized it as generally recognized as safe. Um, another study on um, Sambucus nigra, which is the name for elderberry, and a couple of others said it holds promising specific antiviral activities, scientifically proven through studies on experimental and animal models. So when Whitney said I should be on elderberry, I went out and I got myself a organic extract of it. Uh, here are some more studies that effectively treats upper respiratory symptoms. It stimulates the immune response and prevents, I'm not telling you it'll prevent COVID. I'm not even telling you it will prevent getting infected with human influenza A virus. I am telling you in this study, it prevented viral infection and it showed relatively strong defense against this in influenza virus uh, infection, IVF. And also, this is pretty interesting. So this is a little bit more advanced, but I think you're up to it. I told you about the cytokines and how they can, uh, the cytokine storm can take you out if you have COVID-19. So too many of them, bad idea. Not enough of them, also a bad idea. Because the inflammatory cytokines are there to help you kill stuff. It's only when they get out of control that they're bad. So this study uh, in 2001 showed that elderberry increases the inflammatory cytokines and it named them the IL-1 beat, tumor necrosis factor alpha, IL-6, IL-8, and all of these cytokines were increased two to 45 fold. So it seems, although I have not reviewed the entire literature on this, it seems that this really improves the ability of the body to fight infection via the production of an appropriate amount of, of the inflammatory cytokines. Uh, here's the CBD and cannabidiol reference. Uh, I've looked at this very carefully. There are two articles on PubMed that support the use of CBD for the treatment of hepatitis C and Kaposi sarcosa for the treatment, not prevention, treatment. <clears throat> and one article reported a decrease in neuroinflammation in a virus-induced animal model of multiple sclerosis. So the, these, these authors concluded, however, anecdotal experiences of CBD user use retrieved on the internet, ma mainly from commercial sites, 
on the other side lack any support from sound scientific evidence. So they're saying it's not really a thing. On the other hand, there's Lowe and colleagues who said that CBD exhibited in vitro activity against viral hepatitis C. And more interestingly, as of Saturday, excuse me, yesterday, Sunday, there were 187 citations on CBD and anxiety. And remember I told you stress decreases your immune function. So it may be that CBD cannabidiol will help by decreasing your stress more than it would be a, a major antiviral. I, I'm pretty sold on elderberry though. Here's the review. I've told you five things. Step one, get adequate sleep. Step two, try to lower your stress. You can meditate, you can schedule, you can do holistic things. You can download the Starship Sleeping Quarters, 10-hour um, meditation. Step three is eat your fruits and veggies, supplement with antioxidants, vitamin C, vitamin E, N-acetylcysteine, and there are some other things that also can be used besides N-acetylcysteine. Step four, take your supplements. I like vitamin D and probiotics, plus all the other ones that I was telling you about. And then we talked about shrooms, berries, and CBD, step five. There are the five steps. So I read a book one time called Practicing Radical Honesty. It was a really good book. So here's radical transparency. This is what I take. I take a multivitamin, multimineral fish oil nutritional system, one packet twice daily, and I know it works because I get myself scanned on the biophotonic scanner and my scan score is about 65,000, which for those of you that don't know the scores, that's an A++. It means I'm, I'm covered. And in addition, I try to eat healthfully. Uh, I take the vitamin D plus K2 daily. I take vitamin C, 1,000 milligrams twice daily. I take one tablespoon of organic elderberry syrup daily, although doses up to four times a day have been talked about. I take an immune formula complex. I take a daily probiotic and I take reishi twice daily. That's what I do. Here's the future view of upcoming events. Uh, next Monday, May 4th, I will talk about how to cope with the psychological impact of COVID-19. Uh, the next week, I will talk about do-it-yourself treatment for depression without leaving your home, not as crazy as it sounds. Number four, or number four in the series is going to be very interesting. How to save money on your health care, how to pay reasonable money for excellent care. I found that many of my patients have had their money uh, horribly wasted on uh, prescriptions that other doctors have given them, some that cost 300, some that cost $1,000 that don't work. And then after you get it and you can't tolerate it because you're puking your guts out after you take two or three of them, you got a $1,000 uh, prescription there that's no good to you. So there are ways to beat that. And finally, designing your future, what's coming next. I'm really excited about that because we know that ultimately this pandemic is going to end. And how are we going to come out uh, from our caves at that point? A few other things for your knowledge. Recordings of these webinars uh, should be, they won't be now, and we'll, it'll be a day or two before they come up, but they will be on the katiewellness.com forward slash hope page. Or if you can't remember that, just remember, I'm Katie. I have a wellness institute. Go to katiewellness.com, click the webinars button at the top, and it'll be there. The slide deck for the presentation I just gave is live uh, on slideshare.net forward slash LKDMD. I'd be happy for, it to you, for you to use the slides, go over them, check out the references, uh, use it as a springboard to, uh, to stimulate your own thinking on the matter. And then I've got handout goodies via email if desired. If you want it, make sure we have yours. So here's what it looks like on um, SlideShare. There it is right there boosting your immunity during the COVID-19 pandemic, front and center. I'm going to close with one of the Mayo boys again, who said, for me, the practice of medicine has opened the door to the greatest adventure in life. Medicine is like a hallway lined with doors, each door opening into a different room and each room opening into another hallway 
again, lined with doors. Medicine is always wonderful and never will be finished. Now, it's a great quote, but if we think about that, each room opening into another hallway, we have now entered the hallway of COVID-19, and there are doors off to the side with things that we can do to protect ourselves. And so it's going to be an adventure. I'm not planning on getting infected with it, and if I do, my, I'm planning on having a very mild case. So that's it for tonight. Thank you for attending. Great to have you here. Uh, I believe that my minions behind the scene are working on the questions. There's one of them right there, Elizabeth Harrington. And I am going to stop sharing my screen. Here I am. And Elizabeth, I'm ready for Q&A. You might want to get rid of my personal. Oh, you look fine. I love the flowers. <laughs> So anyway, here's so much for not being on screen. So Dr. Katie, there are quite a few people who may not know you. And I thought it was interesting though, just as we start that um, the, the many references, not too many, but many references. And since I live in Minneapolis, home of the Mayo Clinic, uh, this was of particular importance to me, but maybe you could just explain your connection because I think that's- Important. Yes. To Mayo. Yes. Well, I was a good old boy from down home that grew up with the goat ropers in Northeast Texas, and I had the misfortune to be gifted at the piano. So you can imagine what that was like, a male piano player graduating high school in the early 70s, mid 70s, um, that we, we were looked at kind of askance. And I went on and I got two degrees in music. And then I, I'd always been interested in medicine. Uh, the, the medical doctor shows were always my favorites growing up. So I decided, <clears throat> you know, now or never. So I went back and started pre-med. And uh, amazingly, after one year of pre-med studies, I got hired to teach piano and be a performing artist in residence at Howard Payne University, which I did for three years. I thought, well, you know, I trained for six years for this. I might as well do it. Well, actually, from eight until 24, I trained for it. Uh, so I did that, and then I went back and I finished my pre-med work, went to UTMB, University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston, and then uh, found that Mayo Clinic had a psychiatry uh, program, and I thought, I've heard of those people, I think I'll go there. So I went up here, it was a great education, I loved it, I loved the people. Um, if I had just a moment, I, I, I want to tell you one quick story. I had a patient <clears throat> that came in in the middle of the night who had been excessively bled on his last day of being there with multiple blood tests that had been obtained. And he had had a liver transplant. So he was bled too much and he was extremely anemic and he needed a blood transfusion. So me as a psychiatry resident, I had never ordered a blood transfusion. So I called the hematology resident in the middle of the night. This was like 3 a.m. And I said, I need to give this guy blood cells. What should I do? And he told me exactly the order to write. And I did it. And I said, thank you very much. And he said, I will never forget this. He said, it's no problem. You know, I just woke the guy up at 3 a.m. to ask him this question. It's no problem because that's, that's the way it was there. It's no problem. The patient comes first. In fact, they had this policy the needs of the patient come first. And it was an incredible place to train. I finished in 1993, uh, but with the good, there was some bad. And the bad was no emphasis on vitamins, nothing on supplements, um, nothing on antioxidants. And it was in fact a mentor of mine, John Graff, who uh, shared with me that I don't know the answer to that. We should check the literature that impressed on me the need to submit ourselves and submit myself to the peer reviewed literature in terms of what's published and what's proven and not just what some fringe uh, article on the internet will say, such as injecting bleach is a good idea, which is not, it is not, don't inject bleach. But there, 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 was, there was this meme going around. 
So that's that's what happened. And I ended up in, in Evansville in 1993 practicing conventional psychiatry. Um, and then I got really interested in functional medicine and nutritional medicine, hormone replacement therapy. And I've been combining that with psychiatry. So some of my patients are psychiatric patients and some of them are medical, hormonal, broken down train wrecks of people that are really not that difficult to reclaim with just a little lab testing and, um, and uh, attention to their issues. And in following so, all of those steps that you just outlined for the COVID-19 would probably help with them as well. Would help exactly. Everyone. exactly. You know, Elizabeth, I see 13 things down there in chat, and I think I've seen yeah. some questions come in. So should I click that at this point? Well, we're, you can. We were going let's to do, do it. that for you, but let's do that. All right. All right, so here we go. Um, so let's see here. Hi, welcome to the chat. Hello from Southwest Florida. My email, so if somebody wants, uh, here's an, another one from one of my friends. Corinne Floyd to all panelists and attendees. She's the other power behind the curtain. Thanks, enjoy your presentation. Uh, thanks, thanks. Ah, from Mike McIntosh. He wants to know elderberry capsules as effective. Probably, um, I haven't I haven't done a study on that. I haven't looked at the literature. I'm I'm not entitled to an opinion on that. Uh, but I would say if it's organic, if it's high potency, if it comes from a good source, uh, it would be reasonable. Uh, Cheryl DeBrone wants to know what if we don't have vitamin K2 to go with our vitamin D3. Get it. That's what I would say. Uh, G, the GNC has it at 100 microgram. You can take two of them. That's good enough. But if you are on, you know, if you're on 500 to 1,000 IU of vitamin D, you probably don't need the K2. But if you want the ultimate in wellness and health promoting benefits, <clears throat> and you don't want to plaque out your carotids or your coronary arteries, I would strongly suggest being on the vitamin K2. Um, let's see here. Okay, thank you, Julie. Thank you, Penny. How much, oh, here's a great question. How much NAC per day? And um, I, I was looking at that, that's actually in the handout, but I'm not gonna make you wait for it. Uh, anywhere from 500 to 750, maybe up to 1,000 milligrams three times a day or as much as you can tolerate. Now, here's the problem. NAC does tend, or uh, let, me, let me edit that. NAC may be associated with gastrointestinal upset. So if you're taking a lot of it and you, you, you just can't, you can't deal with it in your gut, then there are other supplements that you can take and that one is in the handout. It's uh, D-ribose, L-cysteine. It's a not from nature, uh, newly synthesized uh, chemical entity by Dr. Herbert Nagasawa, who is a brilliant or was a brilliant researcher and published on it. Uh, let's see. So that's how much NAC per day. Uh, by the way, if you're, if you're a teenager that has a uh, Tylenol or acetaminophen overdose, or anybody that has an acetamin over, acetaminophen overdose, you are going to get gram amounts of N-acetylcysteine infused into your veins over three days. And I think it's like 20,000 milligrams at a time. It's high dose. It's, it's non-toxic, uh, and it will keep them from killing their liver with the Tylenol overdose. Is fresh lemon balm from the garden effective in a tea? <clears throat> well, it probably tastes really good. Um, I don't know how much uh, lemon balm you should put in tea to have an antiviral effect. I, I do have a supplement that I'm, that's in my handout that has got lemon balm, uh, red thyme, oil, garlic, and a couple of other things. So I, I would take I would take it in a supplement form. Uh, and <laughs> from my friend Sue Amon, holy cow, you take that many supplements every day. Well, let me tell you, I do not want to get COVID-19. So uh, I don't usually take 
the reishi or some of the other things, but right now I'm doing it. Um, okay, here's from Joe Noti. I was told that I needed D2, but that is only by a doctor. Is there a difference in that and D3? Absolutely, that's a great question. So vitamin D2 is an FDA approved, regulated prescription medication which can only be prescribed by doctors or other healthcare practitioners like physicians, assistants, nurse practitioners, and so forth, D2. The dose of that uh, is 50,000 international units a week. It's one per week. So one on a Saturday, one on a Sunday, one per week. And your body breaks that down into vitamin D3 the active form of vitamin D, which you can then just groove out on for the rest of the week. So you take a big dose of vitamin D2, your body makes D3 and supplies it to you all week. That dose, 50,000 IU, is equivalent to 5,000 IU of vitamin D3 from the health food store. Now there are a couple of notions about this. Uh, the the uh, fruits, nuts, and flakes, and uh, we want everything organic crowd would say vitamin D2 is, is it's, uh, it's, a far, it's a pharmaceutical, uh, uh, it's, it's a pharmaceutical product. We shouldn't take it. We, sh we should just take what's, what the body uses at the receptor, the vitamin D3. So it's all about the vitamin D3. I don't care. Um, what, what matters to me is how the patient is doing and what the patient's blood level is. I don't care if I get it up with vitamin D2 or vitamin D3, it, it matters not. Some people like little old ladies with bad osteoporosis that if I don't improve their bones quickly, they're going to have a fracture and fall. I've got on 10,000 IU of vitamin D3 and, and by the way, I definitely make sure that they're on K2 as well. So I hope that answers your question. Um, would you use the same dose of probiotic in teens as for adults? Depends on how big the teen, the teen is. If, if they've got an adult sized body, 140, 150 pounds, yes. Um, if not, and the, the other thing about probiotics, very, very good question. They're extremely well tolerated. So if you don't just want to be carpet bombing the teenager's gut with too many probiotics, you could do one every other day or one every other night, and that would be fine. Any comments on superoxide dismutase production from exercise recent UVA study? Oh, that's a good question. Don't have a clue. <laughs> have, haven't looked at that. Uh, although superoxide dismutase um, it's, it's either, I, I think that's an antioxidant and it goes, if your body would be producing it because the exercise is oxidatively stressful. Um, I, I am not an exercise physiologist, so I cannot answer that question, but I tell you how, how we can, we can go to pubmed.gov, all of us after we get off or those that want to know and put in superoxide dismutase, uh, and exercise and then see, but I have not read that study. I'm, I'm sorry, I failed you on that one. Any other questions? Well, that was quite a few. There were a few that came in, um, but they've all, you've answered them all. So there were a okay. few other ones that were all about mostly uh, NAC and vitamin C. So we're good. In fact, you're right. great. So what more can I say that uh, uh, for anyone here, you'll be back next week and uh, that this Hope is- to have you back. Yeah, and everybody who's registered on the call, actually, just so you all know, we do have your email addresses. So um, the gifts and the material that Dr. Katie has talked about, you will all be receiving them. Uh, the other thing I'll mention is if they want to subscribe to our newsletter, which we send out, I'm, I'm not gonna subscribe people to it uh, if they don't wanna be. So if you want to be okay. subscribed on that, email back to us, say, yeah, I want the newsletter too. And it, it, it goes out variably, anywhere from once a week, which is what I'm gonna be doing for this webinar series, to every two, three, four weeks. Well, that's great. 
and I, I would be remiss if I didn't, if I didn't end my participation by thanking uh, Elizabeth Harrington again and Corinne <laughs> Floyd for actually making this work. Um, I'm, I'm just the honor. on-screen, I'm the on-screen talent. They're the geniuses behind <laughs> how we did this. So really appreciate it. Thank you to both of you ladies. Well, the world needs to have this information, uh, Dr. Katie, and we're all uh, looking forward to learning even more. But this is a critical time to bring somebody with your expertise, knowledge, passion, and as I've known through the years of knowing you, your curiosity, your insane curiosity and open mind is something that we can all really value. So, yes. and that's something else. Please, everybody, if you got enjoyment out of this, please share. Uh, share this and make sure that everybody gets the information and can listen to it, of course, free. Um, once it's uh, posted online and invite them um, to uh, the additional four that are coming up and submit questions. So right. thank you again. All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming. It was a joy to present to you, and I hope it's helpful.